All right. So today uh, on the Gospel Eyes podcast, we have none other than Louis Giglio. How are you doing, Louis? I'm doing great, Greg. It's so good to see you. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I was totally fanboying it with Zane Black when we went to Winter Jam. We didn't have to be there that first weekend of the Winter Jam tour, but we came just because we wanted to hear you. And you did such a phenomenal job. And Man, I had some big shoes to fill. And um, obviously, you blazed an amazing trail on Winter Jam and around the world. And it was so cool to get to meet you. And I was sad. My Winter Jam stay was uh, cut short by coronavirus. But man, it was pretty awesome. The few weekends I was out with the Passion guys and Crowder and getting to see you. And um, it was just a real treat. Yeah, it was, it was really good. Lots, lots of people came to Christ. Even though it got cut short, man, so many people came to Christ. And I think we're inspired uh, to really serve the Lord and share the good news of Christ. So appreciate that. And I want to just kind of just dive in, ask you some questions, because I feel like we have an expert on reaching the next generation. I really focus a dare to share on teenagers. Uh, and I know you, you focus on everyone, but I mean, it just seems like with passion, that college age, the 20s and, and early 30s is just your your zone, your strike zone, man. Uh, so just ask you a couple of questions about that. Like what, what do you think are some of the challenges um, to reaching that particular generation with the gospel? Well, you know, I, it's interesting. We've started out uh, with a real heartbeat for college students for 23 years. We've been doing passion gatherings and the focus has been 18 to 25. We're doing that again, passion 2021 coming up and actually just a few weeks from now. But now, you know, being a pastor, I just see people. So I'm going to answer the question, but being on Winter Jam, so many teenagers in the room, but their parents also. And then when I preach every Sunday here, there's every age demographic represented in the building and obviously thousands of people around the world. And Greg, the thing I'm, you know, agree with you about is that the gospel is the gospel. And it's the same power for a 14-year-old or a 64-year-old, but there's something special about that time window around 18 to 25 years old. It's the crossroad of life, I believe. It's where people make the bedrock decisions about who they're going to be, their friend group, normally who they're going to date, maybe marry, the career trajectory that they're going to be on. And I love being on that corner mm -hmm. saying, have you considered Jesus? Um, not church necessarily. I'm not knocking church. I'm a pastor, but a lot of students I've seen on campuses have come from churches, but they just hung that experience on the back of the door the day they got there. And maybe it's because they had an experience of a church, but they missed that real relationship, authentic faith with Jesus. And so what's the biggest barrier? Uh, people seeing them and being willing to live a life and share the gospel with them. Isn't that interesting? I think the biggest barrier to 18 to 25 year olds and people in general uh, coming to Christ is that people don't see that the harvest is plentiful yeah. and it's time for the gospel to be shared. And a lot of times we're nervous or afraid people, people maybe we think don't want to know, don't want to hear, but we shared a story around here today. There was a college student in our city who came to faith during COVID yeah. by coming online to church. She heard a message on anxiety, which was her particular struggle, but she also was struggling with depression and a lot of big questions in life. Successful collegiate athlete, amazing person on the surface, but really hurting inside. And she comes to church, Craig Groeschel's preaching. I'm not even preaching that week. He preaches a message on anxiety. She puts her faith in Jesus and she got baptized at church three weeks ago. And it was the biggest deal to see the light come on in her world. And I think all she needed was somebody who could come across that bridge and say, A, uh, this is not about you trying harder. It's about what Jesus has done for you. And B, we're willing to talk about real life, whether it's depression or anxiety or whatever it is that you're living in right now. Jesus isn't scared of that. And so I think the world's ready. I guarantee you during coronavirus crisis, 
people are ready. In the middle of pandemic, people are searching and the biggest hurdle to this generation coming to know Jesus is just whether or not people who already know the truth are willing to step out and share it with them. Well, believers are the biggest hurdle. You know, we yeah. got we to see people. I remember when I was 12 years old, I went to a little fundamentalist, dispensational, old school field, King James only little Bible church that I'm grateful for because they reached my whole family for Christ. But my youth pastor had me sit on the corner in the mall and just watch people for 30 minutes because I want you to put an imaginary tag on their forehead bound for hell. And I want you to think about the hell they're headed to and the hell they're going through apart from Christ right now. And 30 minutes later, I was bawling and I still see that sign. And I, I agree with you. We just need to have the eyes of Jesus um, and the heart of Jesus, you know, and compassion for the lost. Um, I think just as a side note, I agree with you. I think the coronavirus is accelerated, you know, isolation, which is accelerated desperation, which actually opens the door for more gospel conversations. And it's a great time. Yeah. People are so open to talk right now. And I think we got to seize that opportunity. So Yeah, I was talking to another friend who is a, a chaplain at a major university in in the nation a few days ago and he led two different athletes at his school to the lord in the last few weeks mm -hmm. two different situations a, a guy and a young lady both of them asked him, both of them made the same statement to him eventually they both in conversation said i'm afraid to die mm -hmm. and you know we just sometimes want to stay on the surface with people because People are on the surface with us, but people are thinking about big things. Yeah. And I think we sell God short when we forget that he put his image in people yeah. and he put a hunger in people. He created people with a sense of knowing I'm a part of something big and I don't know exactly what it is. I just know what I'm doing right now. It doesn't feel as big as what I feel like I was made for. Yeah. Or I know there's something out there and I don't know what it is and I'm scared to death because I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And we, we just sell God short when we forget that that's in people. And to speak to that part of people is uh, oftentimes to open the door to them saying, it's amazing that you asked me that. I've been thinking about heaven and what happens when you die. It's crazy that you just asked me that because I've been wondering, like, is there a way to heaven? And then we're just like, oh my gosh, I didn't have any clue that you were thinking that. Why didn't you tell me that? And you're like, well, why didn't you ask me? So I think it's the, it, yeah. it is what you're saying. Jesus looked on the people and he wept because he saw them like sheep without a shepherd. Mm -hmm. We look on the people and we go, hey, I wonder what's going on. Or I wonder what they think about me. Or I wonder what they have that I should have. Or something totally surface instead of just seeing them. And realizing, man, these people, if they don't have Jesus, I don't care what they're giving me out here, they're hurting in here. And I'm going to ask questions about in here and not just accept what I see out here. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like a, go, preaching the gospel at a funeral service. Everybody's thinking about their own mortality. Mm -hmm. It's almost as like there's been a, a global funeral service. Yeah. Every is thinking about mortality, life and death. Suddenly those old EE questions, do you know you're gonna to go to heaven when you die? If I could tell you, would that be, I mean, all of a sudden those are, it seem more relevant because people are afraid of that. So really good, I, you know, it kind of ties in with the question of something bigger than us, but how does worship, because I know, I mean, passion is so known for great preaching and great worship. How have you seen that as a, as a, is a resource to call um, unbelieving, you know, 18 to 25 year olds in to God's family? Man, you know, that's such a good question, Greg. And I, I guarantee you, no one else is going to ask that question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that question before. But I read a book that made a massive impact in my life uh, 30 years ago called Worship Evangelism. The book's by Sally Morgenthaler. She's amazing, I'm sure. I don't know her super well, but I'll save everybody the price of the book. Uh, in the introduction, <laughs> which is where you can find what, what you need to know about most books, is just read what's on the back cover and you're good. 
but in the introduction, she said, and I'm going to paraphrase, people, when they walk into our churches, are making an instantaneous valuation about the veracity of what we say we believe based on our worship. In other words, if you and I went to an Auburn, Alabama football game, you'd be convinced in the first five seconds we were there that I genuinely am an Auburn fan to the core. If uh, we went to a Taylor Swift show at Mercedes, I would know within 10 minutes whether you were with or with, with Taylor or you were just there because your friend got an extra ticket. Yeah, yeah. When people see on our faces and what they feel us emoting in worship, not that worship's all about singing and being at church, but in that dimension, it says something to them. And people walk in church and they either look around and go, man, I don't think these people really believe God's as great as they're singing right now. Because look at him, a dude's over there with his hands in his pockets and he looks bored. Yeah. Versus we went to the Atlanta United soccer game and this guy did not sit down for two and a half hours and lost his mind. That's what this guy really thinks is amazing. So genuine worship by spirit-filled, switched-on people can cause the non-Christian person to go, I don't know if I'm that excited about anything, mm -hmm. or I've never seen people look like that when they were singing about something or declaring something. So that's A. And then B, worship is not supposed to be, I love you, 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 I love you. It's supposed to be a catalog of our thinking and our understanding about who God is and how he's worked in our lives. And so now the lyric is hitting them. Now the lyric is saying, what, there's somebody who would kick down a door for me? Are you kidding me? Nobody ever kicked down a door for me. Nobody ever climbed up a mountain for me. Nobody ever did that for me. So when you've got a ethos, the heart is alive and they know it's real. And then you've got a message over here that is hitting them like nothing else. Then people should be getting saved during the worship. Yeah. Not just during the preaching and the response. People should be getting touched, restored, healed, convicted, mm -hmm. saved as worship is happening. Because uh, God said, if we, if we build him a throne, he'll sit on it. That's a paraphrase mm -hmm. of the psalmist. But he said, worship is a, is a throne, basically, for God. And so when we do gen genuinely enter in, it somehow heightens God's desire to be in our midst. And when God is in our midst, things change. And with passion, it's a little bit different. We're not worshiping at passion so much so that the lost world can watch and see. We're just worshiping because it gets us close to the heart of God. And when you're close to the heart of God, you get a heartbeat for the world. And we want people to leave passion thinking about the world. You know, it makes me think of uh, 1 Corinthians 14 when Paul's talking to the Corinthians. You know, if, if unbelievers come in and everybody's speaking in tongues, they're going to think you're crazy. But if you're prophesying, you'll be convinced in your heart that you're a sinner and fall down and say, God is surely among you. And I think, you know, when when the word of God is being sung or spoken, preached, and you know, like you said, everybody, everybody believes it, there's a conviction that takes place. And I think that really makes the case for really having solid, Christ-centered, cross-centered, resurrection-centered music that you know i worship with my spirit i pray with my spirit i pray with my mind also because that i love that people getting saved during the worship during the worship service because the cross is being preached you know? yeah absolutely a friend of mine when i was you know a really young minister minister when i was a young guy just coming into ministry it's an older pastor in england and i spent a lot of time around him and he taught me about the worship diet and mm -hmm. It's a phrase that we still use in our culture when I'm talking with our worship leaders and everything can't be a brand new song. I mean, the scripture says, sing a new song to the Lord. So if people say it has to be in the hymnal. They're not reading out of the Bible. Um, nothing in the hymnal was in the hymnal forever. So one of those days, one of those hymns was a new song. And I'm glad somebody didn't say no new songs here, only hymns. Okay. But it can't all be new songs. It can't all be nine verse hymns. Yeah. It doesn't all need to be about the cross. Some of the songs need to be about the resurrection. Some of them need to be about, be about heaven. Some of them need to be about hell. Some of them need to be about the strength of the body going through struggle. 
but Jesus has to be at the center of it all. And the key, key, key thing is these songs have to have some, they have to be birthed in a garden of theological uh, veracity. And I know a lot of movements, and I think I sort of serve that role in our movement unofficially, but you got to have non-musicians, non-artists who are older and wiser looking at these songs. And even I mentioned Reckless Love, you know, there's a big debate about that song. And I'm kind of on the other side of that debate. I'm, I wish Corey had tweaked that lyric slightly because God's love isn't reckless. Reckless means I made a decision, I didn't think about it, and then all these consequences happen. Uh, I ran through an intersection because I was on my phone, and now look at the collateral damage that happened. That's reckless. Mm -hmm. Nothing about what God did on the cross was reckless. It was all purposed, intended, planned, decided mm -hmm. before the foundation of the world. It was on purpose, mm -hmm. the love of God. And it did kick down doors and climb up mountains and light up shadows it did all those things, but it was the on purpose love of God. And yes, it looks reckless to a human, but it wasn't reckless to God. So, and Corey explains all that, blah, 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 blah. But it's the, it's the lens. It's like these songs matter is what I'm saying. And we're teaching people theology while we're inviting them to have an experience with God. It's, it's so good. And you know, one of the things I love about Crowder uh, touring with him, you have to think about his lyrics. <laughs> some some worship songs you don't have to think about; you just sing it over and over. You have to really think through and concentrate. And I think it's just good. It's a good reminder, and I love that 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 worship diet idea. Yeah, and, Crowder makes you use your mind, and I think God's proud of that. And it's the diet. So you Crowder could have a song that um, uses a word that you would never think fit in a worship song. But you know, one of the most powerful worship songs of all time is the song, uh, Alleluia. And it has one word in it, Alleluia. It means praise the Lord. And yeah. the song is Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. That's it. And so the song you're just saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. That's a good song. Yeah. It's a good biblical song. That can't be your only song. No. But you put that next to a Crowder song that makes you think, put it next to a hymn that lets you feel like you're a part of something old, put it next to a new worship song that lets you feel, oh, there's new air in the room. That's the worship diet. And if you get that right, I think your church is going to be a lot healthier. So good. And I just, I appreciate you, uh, I, you know, shepherding and coaching and helping this conversation along because I, I believe there's so much potential theologically solvent sledgehammer, you know, jamming worship songs ready to be written out there. And, and the more your soul is lit aflame with truth and theology, the more your pen's got to go, you know, yeah. and they're out there ready to be written. So praise God. Thanks. Thanks for your role in that. And, uh, with passion and help and guide that. Well, I'm going to ask you an evangelism question. I'm the dare to share guy, so I got I have to do that, um, and I want to do that. So, how do you like at, with with Passion City, really um, prepare you know the people in your church um, to obviously invite people out, which is which is part of it, but also to engage in gospel conversations with those around them? Yeah, you know, I think that I, uh, it's a challenging question because I, I came out of the EE era, like you mentioned earlier, and that was my life and background. And I think at Passion City, what we're doing is is a couple of things. Number one, we we share the gospel every Sunday. Yeah. And so, it you know, it's hard. I, every Sunday is a stretch maybe, but we preach the gospel every Sunday. And we give people an opportunity to put their faith in Jesus almost every gathering. And people do put their faith in Jesus in almost every gathering. So it'd be very rare that two Sundays would go by and we're not extending if you want to put your faith in Jesus right now. So people are hearing the gospel as a regular part of what we do. It's not like an evangelistic Sunday or we have a, re a revival weekend. Every time we're together, the gospel is in the mix. And what I'm challenging people to do, Greg, is to live the kind of life that leads to why. 
Mm. And that's been our evangelism strategy at Passion City Church more than um, here are 10 verses you should memorize. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, But to say, if you're not living a life that your coworker ultimately is going to say to you, hey, why did you say that? Or why did you respond that way? Or what's going on with you in this area of your life? Then everything else we were going to tell them ultimately is going to contradict what they see in our lives. And so we point more to that. Be prepared to give everyone an answer for the hope that that you have, the hope that's in you. Uh, to give them an answer. What is that sort of predicated on the idea that you would live a a life that would lead to why? And so we preach the gospel, teach the Bible. In the process of that, we teach and preach the gospel constantly so that I think you heard me enough on Winter Jam on one weekend to know that if somebody said, well, what is the difference? What's the thing about Jesus? Somebody in our church would be able to say, well, It's not about being good or bad. It's about being dead or alive. And they would immediately be able to take the gospel, unpack it that way and share it. They've heard you give it every, 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 every Sunday. That's so good. Really? You know, um, I love that. Leave the kind of question. You know, first Peter 315, oftentimes people use it as an apologetics passage. But as you know, first Peter is about suffering. And it's really when somebody sees you undergo suffering, and they're like, hey, why, why are you at, re-? like you said, why are you reacting like this? It, it really is not as much about apologetics as it's about gospel giving out of gospel living. And yeah. this, that, so good. I love that. Real, this is, this is a, a little side note, but I think it's important. I have a challenge when I, I talk to pastors oftentimes and I beg them, would you please give the gospel every week and i i go to a big church here in denver and i you know i don't know the pastors because they usually preach at a different campus it's a a great church but i pray every week lord help them give the gospel help them give it clearly because you know and i know that there are people in congregations around the nation around the world that are visiting they're in or they've been but they don't got it and it may be that sunday i mean just i what challenge would you give pastors to, to make sure they, you know, like that old quote, you know, take my text and I make a beeline for the cross to really give the gospel on a consistent basis? Well, you know, I would challenge pastors, Greg, same as you, preach the message that the Holy Spirit sets on fire in your heart. Mm. And if that's a message about uh, husbands loving their wives and um, wives respecting their husbands, great, then preach that message and unpack it in a practical way. I think that it is good for the church to be practical and relevant and uh, to preach a message that anybody in my neighborhood neighborhood could hear and go, oh, babe, that could help us because, you know, we, we need some help in our marriage. But loving your wife as Christ loved the church and respecting your husband as the head of your home are only possible ultimately to the full, if you understand that that whole passage is given in a gospel context. And so that's what I try to teach our church, get into the text, which is verses seven through eight, but then look at the context for the text. And the context, if you keep going out, is the gospel. And without that gospel engine, the regenerated heart, the Holy Spirit indwelling in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, as Paul wrote it, then what is all of the rest of this? It's just principles that you can go by in any book, anywhere on planet Earth and do your best and your ability to go for your best life now, live out your dream, get your goal, accomplish your thing, help your marriage, grow your business, blah, blah, blah. And so all that's good, but that's not what the church is for. The church is here to share that there's a supernatural transformational possibility on the table for every human being where God indwells man and transforms man through the indwelling power of the spirit and the life of Christ. And that's what church is about ultimately. So what message can you preach without including that? 
And I feel like at the end of the day, the world is lost <laughs> more than the world um, is unchurched. You know, the world's dead mm -hmm. and dead is a problem. Yeah. And you only get alive through the gospel. So I think that if you want your church to grow, you should preach the gospel. And um, some people eventually are going to tell you, hey, that's all great, but we just want to go deeper with the Lord. And I'm like, I'm all for deeper with the Lord, but the church grows best when people get saved. Well, and it doesn't, I don't think it gets any deeper than the mystery of the cross and the empty tomb. I mean, every week it seemed like they had communion in the early church. And that's a, you know, visceral, visual, visceral expression of the blood and body of Christ. I think yeah. so. Uh, mostly youth leaders uh, watching this podcast, listening to this podcast. Um, what would you say to encourage a youth leader? Because I know you kind of you kind of get a lot of you know the the results of youth ministers' impact on kids' lives. How how can they best prepare their middle school students and high school students? for those kind of college crucial crossroads years we were talking about earlier? I think a couple of ways. Number one, I think just being authentic is, is probably the key. I, I really believe that a student who sees a mom or a dad, either one, living out an authentic faith and sees a youth leader and a youth leadership team mm -hmm. living out an authentic faith is maybe the best thing that can happen to them. Hmm. And the, the, con, the, the opposite of that would be, I, 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 we all went to church, but I've never seen my dad on his knees before. Hmm. Or my dad was a deacon, but I never saw my dad in his study crying over a text of scripture. Hmm. Or my mom sang in the choir, but we never prayed as a family. Hmm. And what that does in somebody's mind is, is it, it divides the the authentic from the show mm -hmm. and it separates those two things. And I think just to kids are going to struggle. Every kid going to college is going to question their faith. They're going to sow their oats, whatever that is. They're going to push the boundary. They're going to figure out, Oh, I've got freedom. What am I going to do with that freedom? Every kid's going to go through that. But the ones who are going to come on the other side of it and land with Jesus are going to be the ones that have, that picture in their mind, my mom or my dad or my friend or my coworker, my, my roommate, my, my sorority sister. I've seen this in someone before, not just heard about it. I think the second thing is besides being authentic is just to begin to have those conversations and to say, look, this is what life is about. Life isn't lived in a cocoon like the youth ministry. Life's lived out in the real world where everything goes where every opinion gets a hearing and where your opinion is probably going to get bashed and smashed. And so if you want to walk with Christ and you're thinking about going to the University of Georgia or going to the University of Nevada, then you better figure out what you believe right now because you're going to be in a situation. And I think high school kids now are already, you know, fast forwarded into that moment because they're getting their faith bashed in high school. So they don't have to wait till their, you know, lit, lit prof at school tells them the Bible's a, you know, stitched together book of fables. They already got somebody in their classroom in middle school telling them that they think they're stupid because they're a Christian. So I think it's preparing. And so if I can say this, Greg, it, it's maybe a few less pies in the face and a few more in-depth Bible studies. And uh, a pie in the face is great. We do that at Passion City. And I think it's awesome. It just lets kids know we're having a good time. Everybody's cool. We're all in it. But eventually you have to match that with, I'm going to teach you the Bible. Yeah. And I'm going to teach you about faith. And I'm going to teach you about how to walk. And if you don't want to learn that, then I'm sorry. You'll have to go somewhere else because that's what we're going to teach here. Because at the end of the day, I'm not pumped up that I had 98 kids in the youth ministry when they walked out the door. And two years later, only 12 of them were actually following Jesus. So I would rather have had the 12 back here or the 24 back here gone deep in our faith and had 20 of them walking with Jesus. And so 
it's trading the success of we had a successful youth ministry and a bunch of kids came to camp with man i really think we produced a few dozen really solid disciples this year and they're going to be able to go to school and make more disciples and you and i both know that the exponential effect of disciple making blows away the additional numbers of how big your ministry was in a matter of 36 months you've already blown all that out of the water yeah man that's so good i feel like you're just dropping gold nuggets on catcher it's really good bluey um as you kind of, as we kind of wrap this up, it, how, a couple of things, how can youth leaders pray for you? And then how can they connect with you on you know, Instagram or podcast or, uh, you know, passion? What are, what, what, how can they pray for you and how can they connect with you? Yeah, just touching back, if I can, real fast on that question. It was such a good question. You know, Jesus spoke to 5,000 people, but I doubt seriously he was really pumped about that as much as he was that he had 120 people in his tribe. And he made a point of letting us know that 12 of those 120 were his guys. And he made a bigger point of letting us know that three of those 12 guys were his crew. Mm -hmm. And he always would say, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. So he had a ministry model that wasn't aggregate. It wasn't how many people can I get on a hillside? It was who on the hillside today really was interested. And then he would go after the interested party. So I think I just want to say that again to all the youth leaders that are with us. Uh, Yes, it's awesome. Do a blowout thing at the high school gym. Yes, do something at the football stadium at the high school. Yes, invite a band in and have a big night of course do that and of course try to touch as many people as possible but just keep your eye open like i know you're already doing for that guy or that girl that's the hanging around when it's over every time going is there anything else like could we is there anything you didn't add into your talk tonight because these guys have short attention spans uh because if you had some more in there i'd like to hear everything you had prepared for this talk tonight could i meet with you tomorrow for a a milkshake because I'm down for whatever was in the notes that you didn't have time to share. I want to grow in my faith. Those people are in every student ministry. And a lot of times uh, the the investment in that one or two or three is what's going to pay the dividends 10 years down the road or 40 years down the road. And um, I'm one of those guys to a guy who went to heaven back in the 80s and he poured into me and uh, poured into Andy. And I am, whatever I've done, he's, he's a part owner of. Yeah. And that's pretty awesome to think about that. And so uh, I think praying for me, Greg, just put it in the moment is just, you know, I want to keep faith. I want to keep faith. I want to hang on to faith. And that's one of the things that Paul challenges to. Uh, Yeah, run the race, fight the fight, but keep the faith. And right now, you know, there's a lot of pressure on people to not keep the faith. In other words, to give up on God's plans, on God's promises, on God's character, and on his church. And I want to, in the midst of pandemic, because this is going to be with us for a minute, And in the midst of all this uncertainty and heartache and disappointment and loss, I just want to keep believing every day God is bigger than all this. And I want to lead out of that well. And so I have to keep filling that well of faith and belief and keep my worship strong so that I can continue to not have to fake it, but really say to people, God's greater than pandemic. He's greater than 2020. He's greater than whatever it is you're going through right now and that's the message i want to keep carrying to our church and keep carrying to the world people can find me my name's uh, louis giglio so there's not too many of those on instagram so (laughs) that's where i am louisgiglio.com there are a few free resources there it's not like a uh, a landmine or a gold mine i should have said it might be a landmine it's not a gold mine of resources but there's a couple of free articles there um a free devotional 
and people can keep up with what's going on, see all of our resources. One thing I did want to just say, since you've got student leaders in the mix, is we just came out with Goliath Must Fall for young readers, and that's that uh, 9, 10, 11 age range, um, just coming you know, into the middle school zone. And I love the message of that book, and um, we rewrote it and reskinned it for a 10-year-old reader and just came out, I think, last week. So encourage nice. people to get their hands on that. Goliath Must Fall. What a great time. The Young Reader's Version. Young Reader's Version. Louis, thank you so much for all you do for the kingdom. And I know it's Christ in you and through you, but um, I'm very grateful for your leadership. And uh, we're going to be praying for you, and let's finish this thing well. Thanks so much. Hey, you're a stud, man. I look up to you and appreciate the impact you have on the church all around the world. So thanks for having me on today. One team.